All right, so if you haven't, if you haven't read or, or heard about the Ministry for the, Fu for the Future, it's a sci-fi book that came out about a year and a half, two years ago, about using crypto to solve the climate crisis. And it is based explicitly on the work of Dr. Dalton Chen, who we are thrilled to have at SBS. <laughs> Thanks, Ellen. Um, so I think, I think one, of the, one of the things that would be, would be good to start with is could you just sort of in a few sentences just give an overview of what the GCR, the Global Carbon Board, is? Sure. Well, it's definitely a market-based policy, but unlike traditional market policies, it's supported by monetary policy and central banks as the public finance guarantor. So in this uh, policy, it's unique because it identifies uh, and works with the concept of a positive externality. Now, uh, if you listen to economists talking at conferences like this all around the world, they often focus on the negative externality, the social cost of carbon. They don't really have a theory yet uh, for a global positive externality that can address all the risks. What they have is a standard theory, Bigu's theory, for addressing the costs based on utility. Right. And what I'm saying is the, the natural solution is the, the carbon reward in this matrix format that, that provides the scalable funding for the removal and conventional mitigation. Right, 100%. And I think, I think this matrix is really helpful for thinking through it. I think it's, it's pretty clear to people what the carrot is on the top Right, that's you, you pay someone to do something, it's pretty clear what the stick is on the bottom, right? It's, it's you, you penalize something, right? Can you explain what the, what the left and right hand sort of columns are? Fine. Uh, those columns are fundamental to market pricing and money because they denote the two major options for unit of account. So in, in a market policy, what are the units you can use that store value? Well, Conventionally, it's fiat money, US dollars, uh, Colombian pesos, Australian dollars. So uh, in taxes and subsidies, things are priced with those currency units. The right-hand side introduces a new instrument, which is tradable, and it has carbon units. And so you're creating two different contexts for value. The point being that if, if you do introduce the carbon reward, the fourth quadrant, it opens up monetary policy because that instrument is much closer to money. It's much closer to a regular currency, and so it can interface with central bank policy. Right, got it. And, and maybe we could just give an example, like what is, so on the left-hand side, right, we have these policies that are denominated in fiat money, right? And so can you give an example of a carbon subsidy? Like, I, just so people can like have something to jump to, like what does that mean exactly? Yes, yeah, so a carbon subsidy is when a government uh, offers money, maybe proportional to the mitigated carbon, an example is 45Q. That's an American policy that the Trump administration introduced for sequestration. Um, another example would be the Inflation Adjustment Act, which has money and tax deductions for mitigating actions. Right. And then, and then a carbon tax. I think people, people generally, how does a carbon tax work? Just so people have it fresh in their mind, exactly like, well, what the mechanics are. Uh, that's when governments uh, try to enforce a price on pollution in the simplest way possible. And the problem with taxes is that economists love them, but they're very difficult to implement politically in many countries, including Australia, and I imagine in the US as well. Right, 100%. And then on the right-hand side, so on the left-hand side, we have things that don't require this extra carbon token or any sort of tradable unit of account that is directly linked to carbon. But on the right side, we do. So cap and trade, what, is, what does that look like in a cap and trade system? Okay, cap and trade is somewhat similar to a tax. It's a stick. But instead of setting a price to discover the quantity of pollution, you set a cap on pollution, trade the instrument, which is the emissions permits, to discover the price. Right. So it's kind of reversal. The cap and trade invokes the Coase theorem for private bargaining such that the optimum is a bit different. It's a Pareto optimum, meaning that people are kind of happy with the result because they traded their way there. Um, and the carbon reward also uses this approach, but for the opposite, for mitigation. Right, and so, so in order to implement this policy, you have to have this new tradable instrument that is directly tied to the number of tons of, of carbon that are emitted or, or avoided. 
And the way that that interacts with the monetary system is, is different whether it's a carrot or a stick. So what's, what's so special about having a tradable carbon unit with a positive price? Up in that upper right hand corner there. There are a lot of um, potential. Maybe, maybe I just asked you to explain yeah. the last like eight years of your work. Yeah. Um, well, the amazing thing about this possibility is that it might be the missing link to the economics. So I'll refer to Lord Nicholas Stern. He's the famous British economist who wrote the Stern Report. He recently published a paper, actually early this year, saying, uh, look, uh, we have a major risk problem. Uh, we're going to have to leave standard economics and come up with some solutions because he wants a guardrail. Now, the other economists don't agree with him because they're wedded to the standard theory, which is in the matrix. And what I'm saying, if Nicholas Stern is watching, hey, um, maybe you've got it a bit wrong. You're nearly there, but just consider the matrix and go to the reward, and that's where we can manage systemic risk and price the risk, right. literally. 100%. And I think that one of the terms that you brought up in your talk was this idea of carbon quantitative easing, where the idea is that there's been a lot of quantitative easing you know, over the past decade or so in the economy. Um, and any monetary policy, when the, when the central bank steps in and you know, issues new money according to some rules, that is going to distort the economy in some way, right? And fiscal policy obviously does. So like, so what would be, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe the answer to this question is kind of obvious, but like, what would be different if monetary policy were directly aimed at taking carbon negative technologies and making them feel richer. <laughs> trying to spell this out really clearly, right? So the question is, um, how would it affect the economy if we yeah. did introduce the reward? Yeah, what's, yeah. what's like the difference between, between traditional quantitative easing and like how does that distort okay. the economy and how mm. does carbon quantitative easing distort yeah, it, the economy? Yeah, right? th this is a really uh, topical point. So with, car uh, with quantitative easing that we're familiar with, yeah. that concept was invented by Richard Werner, professor of economics, but his concept wasn't what they're doing. He proposed the money be created and invested more in real production to create jobs and grow the economy. However, the, the central bankers didn't really like that, so they decided they would do quantitative easing to buy financial assets, and they do have a logic for this. It makes some sense. What it means is uh, people are going to invest more in riskier assets because the bonds are uh, becoming too expensive. So. Uh, they're shifting the investment on the frontier of investing to stimulate the economy because they're trying to s prevent a recession. Okay? Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's sort of anti-deflationary, if you like. Now, um, carbon quantitative easing, yes, it's monetary expansion, but the money is going proportionally to mitigation with this correlation to carbon. And what it's intended to do is de-risk the whole problem. Okay, however, I want to highlight something. The world is discussing climate risk. It, it's a very big topic nowadays. Central banks talk about risk, financial risk due to global warming, and all the scientists are freaking out about planetary boundaries and positive feedbacks. We're seeing the hurricanes, the floods, the droughts, the fires, bleaching of coral reefs, etc. Are these risks? Yes, they are. They're risks, they're impacts and risks, but they're downstream. So we've, we don't have our eye on the ball. The real risk is upstream in the economy because that's where we're stuck. So we have a systemic risk, which is this carbon lock-in, which is a societal lock-in, and that's what this is managing. It's bypassing that, uh, that carbon lock-in and unlocking it. Yeah. 100%. And so I, I think one of the ways to see this also is that through a combination of different policies, there's, at least a year or two ago, there was a trillion dollars of subsidy for fossil fuels, right? And clearly that's having these distortionary effects. And so if rather than directly supporting fossil fuels, we could directly support things that are climate positive, right? That's, that's another sort of piece of this, right? All of these policies are gonna change the facts on the ground. They're gonna change what's going on in the world and we should explicitly engineer them to do what we need to do to, to de-risk climate change? Yes, if, if you look at the climate problem as a risk uh, management problem, where do you begin? Well, you do have to tackle the energy infrastructure because of the, the physical carbon lock-in risk, which means 
avoiding the Industrial Revolution for developing countries, uh, mothballing coal-fired power plants and gas-fired power plants, or tacking on some CCS or something, if that's going to work. Uh, but here, the key point is if we're going to fund like $3 trillion extra investment in a rapid energy transition, uh, what's the justification? Because it doesn't fit into that utilitarian model of cost-benefit. And, and the philosophy is actually well established in economics. It's called cost-effectiveness. Cost effectiveness is not so well known, but it's used in the medical industry because there the morality is a bit different. It's about saving lives. Uh, so here we're saving, in a sense, the economy's, the economy's life as a living superorganism, uh, protecting the biosphere and making sure we don't pass planetary boundaries or reach tipping points, or even more simply, that we have an economy that can respond to uh, climate change over the long term in an orderly way. The, yeah. Hundred percent. And I, I, I like that. I like that analogy. Like, in order to save the life of the hyperstructure that is the economy, but also the lives of of many individual people, we need to to borrow this sort of risk assessment that is designed to save lives, right? Well, when it comes to individuals, communities, society, um, it gets more complicated, doesn't it? Because uh, the reality is, if we spend the trillions on uh, the energy transition and building lots of solar uh, farms, wind farms, and so on, that's going to have a big impact on the environment. Even reforestation, uh, land management's going to have a big impact. There will be stakeholders who won't like it. There's going to be people's lives disrupted. So um, how do you manage such a complex problem? The method that I'm proposing and through the policy is the co-benefits. So we, we create a secondary price signal that adjusts the reward higher for projects that have good co-benefits and lower for those that don't. And if the, the ups and the downs and the reward adjustments are equal, that's across the whole economy, then you have a workable mechanism. Right. So I think that's, that's really crucial, right, is, is the global carbon reward isn't issued just directly and proportional to tons of carbon. If something has really good co-benefits, so I think we're very used to in this space thinking about those co-benefits, thinking about how we're not just removing carbon, but regenerating ecosystems, helping people on the ground, uh, avoiding carbon lock-in, like all of these different parameters, that goes into that, that adjustment. Exactly, yeah. Got it. Um, I think, so moving into sort of the dynamics of how this plays out, right, you've, you've talked about um, the silver gun hypothesis as being sort of a step on the road to the GCR. Um, can you explain what's the difference between what people commonly refer to as a silver bullet, right, versus what's a silver gun? Okay, this uh, name I came up with, the silver gun hypothesis, this refers to a very technical thermodynamic theory. And because it's so technical, I generally don't talk about it, but the uh, idea is that we tend to be focusing on silver bullet solutions that's technological, like I think of Greta Thunberg. Uh, I know she said in public that we have all the technologies, we have the solutions, we just got a political problem, but I, I'm in disagreement because uh, money is a technology and economic policies are technologies and I feel we don't have the right financial technology to create the silver gun to shoot all the bullets. Because it's, the idea of the gun metaphor is that the problem is probabilistic. So you've got to fire as many bullets as you can at the target, and if you fire enough bullets, maybe you can get there. I, I know you're not, you're not a crypto person in your background, but if you are used to thinking of money as a technology, you are in the right place, I think. <laughs> Um, so, right, so the silver gun hypothesis is, is sort of deeply technical, but what it ladders up to is people have all these different ideas that could turn out to be a silver bullet, maybe they will be, maybe they won't be, but we need to empower them to, to try it, right, and we need to, like, fund the things that work. That's right, so because the silver gun is such a technical theory, uh, which we won't talk about, um, the meme that's used in my work is the living systems economy. I showed it actually earlier today, the two economies in parallel, they're analogous to respiration and photosynthesis, and they have a thermodynamic basis. Yeah. So I think one of the 
differences between this and carbon offsets. Can actually, can you say where carbon offsets fit into this, this sort of diagram, just to yeah. orient ourselves? Sure. This is the simplified matrix, just the core, because these policies are governmental uh, compliance policies. Um, on the bottom, just outside the matrix, are the carbon credits. Right. And they feed back up into the sticks. So not shown on the right, there are uh, voluntary cap and trade, voluntary offsetting. Not shown here, but on the left is the voluntary carbon tax, which is shadow pricing. Right. And all four on the bottom, shadow pricing tax, tax, cap and trade, and voluntary offsetting, all can be offset. Right, so yeah. two other squares that aren't pictured here that are part of the voluntary part are either like an internal carbon price inside of a company or carbon offsets, which are, right. Yes, offsets technically are not really in the matrix. Right. They're outside, and the reason is offsetting conventionally uh, really just reduces the aggregate cost of mitigation. Offsetting wasn't originally put forward as a primary means of mitigation. It's just that in the voluntary market, it's better than not having it. It's better than, if you have a situation where you don't have enough policy, at least corporates like Google or whomever right. are, are voluntarily offsetting. Right. Can you, can you talk a little bit about additionality? So I think one of the really compelling things about a carbon reward, you're like, <laughs> we're doing a, doing a, a quick tour through, uh, through a lot of thought. Um, one of the things about a carbon reward is that you're not comparing to a counterfactual. Right, and so how, do the, how, how, does that, um, how does that give us a very clear idea of how this financial instrument is actually affecting the facts on the ground? Sure. Additionality is, is, is a tricky topic. Uh, categorically, I'd have to say it is comparing against a counterfactual because at the end of the day, you do need to be additional. The point here is that with the reward, we would focus the reward on the kinds of projects that are unambiguously additional. Not on the edge, but clearly, you know, hundreds of tons, thousands of tons additional. Like, you know, decarbonizing a whole industry, steel, cement, or shipping, or aviation. So you, you know it's significant, and then you can focus your attention on how much you want to pay. And that's where we adjust the baseline. Not a regular baseline, but a carbon intensity baseline. And that baseline is calibrated to the right price to get these industries to sign on board. Once they're signed on, bang, they'll decarbonize quickly. What, can you talk about the role of DMRV and information on the ground? I think that's something that we think a lot about in our field is how are we getting information about what's you know, really happening in some, um, either along some supply chain or in some area that we're trying to protect, right? And building a lot of tools to allow that to feed into um, you know, all of the, the financial technologies that we're, we're building to try to aim resources at building a regenerative economy, right? So I guess what are, one of the things that I, I think is really exciting about the Global Carbon Reward and, and this community is that there are a lot of things we can build that will push us in the direction of the Global Carbon Reward without the full, you know, before the full reward is actually implemented at a global scale, right? There's a lot of work we can do in parallel. So what are the pieces of sort of informational plumbing that are, are gonna be necessary, things like DMRV, in order to, to get this to work? Very good question. So uh, by way of background, I'll just point out first that people who promote the tax love it because it has low information content and thus is efficient However, if you take a thermodynamic perspective of the problem, uh, there's an understanding that if you want to take carbon out of the atmosphere or mitigate, it is inherently information intensive. And so my argument is to manage the systemic risks, we need that information. So the whole platform for the reward policy will be collecting all the relevant information, MRV, DRMV, and so on, storing it, and then giving it back to the marketplace, to the world, at, at no cost, so that all market actors have instantaneous market knowledge as to what's going on in terms of what technologies are working uh, and earning the most profit, because they're working well. So um, I think you, you were talking about supply chains and things like that. Uh, well, all the technologies that I see today and in general 
they work well, if they work well with carbon credits, carbon offsetting, they'll work well with the reward. They just might have to be adapted to a new standard and new platforms. But I think the best way to implement the policy will be to uh, open source it to a degree, to take the best technologies and let them grow again to this new market. So I, I see it as actually quite a good way to get it going. You start as we are today with carbon markets and then you branch off into carbon rewards. I don't want to drop this mic because it might break, but you know, <laughs> I think that's, so I, you know, I think we've heard, we've heard what we have to do, right? We have to, we have to build the, in an open source way and in a way that enables people to develop their own silver bullets, right? Build all of that infrastructure so that once, uh, once central banks come on board and, and you know, recognize the fact that it is within their remit or should be within their remit to prevent one of the largest threats to, for example, price stability and job growth, um, which is climate change, um, that uh, they can just start supporting that currency, right? Is that, is, that a, is that a way to the GCR? More or less, yes. Uh, the way I see it is that uh, the, the actual currency, uh, XCC, carbon currency, I think let the government sort that out, central banks and banks, because that's what they do. But with the platforms for mitigation and rewarding and co-benefits and stakeholders, yeah, that's going to be decentralised. It has a lot of um, opportunities there for all, a lot of different technologies. And I, honestly, I can't even imagine what it would look like because, it, you know, it would be so huge. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, I think that's, that's something that is very good to do in a decentralized and open source way, right, is, is do that sort of collective imagining of what are different routes uh, to, to move in that same direction, right? And where does what we want to do with realigning the economy to, to meet up with the natural world intersect with what's possible given both our political reality and our, our current technological state, right? Um, I also wanted to highlight something that you, that you mentioned sort of in the middle of that, which is that I think maybe a good way of thinking of the left and right sides are that on the left, because you can do everything in terms of money, um, those are, are sort of lower bandwidth um, policies, right? So, so you collapse everything down to money, which is, which is designed to be low bandwidth, right? It's designed to be this kind of minimum value signal. And on the right, you have these other, these other systems, right, which involve this tradable carbon asset and therefore necessarily involve more information being flowed through the economy in order to, to direct value to the right places. Is that, is that one way of thinking about it? Uh, it gives a different context to value because you, you're, with the instrument, the theory is you can introduce another objective. So this is uh, uh, a theory in economics uh, that your number of tools must mas match the number of objectives. And the key point here in the, in the new conceptual model I'm claiming that we have two objectives. One is to manage the costs, it's utilitarian, and the other is to manage the risk, which is a guardrail. So we need at least two instruments. What are they? Sticks for costs and carrots for risk. And thus we have these four policies. Sounds like a very like systems of equations type situation where you, you, need, you need the right number of levers to get the right answer. Yeah, it does become rather theoretical, and I don't want to uh, overdo it with the theory, but uh, it's worth stating that there are many examples or examples in everyday life where we have a two-objective optimization. So um, I, one example is cost and risk. So you walk into the shop, you take the shortest route because it saves you money, that's a cost. But if you've got to cross a busy road, you might get killed, that's a risk. So you take longer, so you're trading off uh, costs and efficiency with risk and safety. So that's a two objective optimization and, and that's the modality or the, the, the basis of this matrix. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. Um, so I wanted to dig in a little more to, in your view, how, um, how, this, how this mobilizes people, right? So how does having this guaranteed floor price in the GCR affect the technologies that people are going to develop and their ability to develop them? I think it's going to have a huge impact. So uh, the, the concept that comes to me most quickly is the idea that we have a, a hundred year price signal into the future, knowing it's supported by central banks, it's got a, a public finance guarantee. So immediately, since that price is for carbon removal, we will see a, a, like a gold rush to carbon removal. 
the more investment, more research and development will lower the price of mitigation over the long term. So we get double benefits. We get the, the investment, we get the R&D, and we lower the costs. So it's better for everyone. Right. Yeah. Um, you mentioned co uh, social responses. This is interesting because social science experiments have found that when you introduce carrots and sticks together, it does um, maximize cooperation. It's been shown in game, gaming experiments, uh, and it kind of makes sense. This, I think, applies to people at a human level. Others might disagree to the morality of it to a certain degree, but I think it makes a lot of sense for business because they're really committed to their balance sheet. They've got to make a profit to stay uh, alive as a business. And then for governments, the advantage is governments can allow the policy to take a lot of the cost off their fiscal budget. So it's covered by the monetary policy. The carbon quantitative easing spreads the cost globally as uniform monetary inflation. And it, 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 it has this way of uh, the price signal attracts the private sector to buy the currency as an investment. So it's the best of both worlds. We get the private sector buying it, they pay for mitigation. If they, if they can't buy any more for whatever reason, the central banks then buy it and we spread the inflation. And that's not necessarily a bad inflation because in the long term, if we don't do that, we will have a different type of inflation, which is CPI inflation, consumer inflation, because everything's becoming more expensive because we've got extreme weather and droughts and we can't grow crops, for right. example. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think I think that resonates a lot that like if you don't have certainty around that that long term view, right? If you're you're not sure what the price for carbon is going to be, if there's if you're not sure how much fossil fuel lock in there's going to be over the long term, um, everyone it, it's hard to plan, right? You have to kind of have one foot in each in each possible version of the future, right? Um, whereas uh, if we can coordinate everyone through this sort of massive overall price signal, that's that's a much more of, it ends up being a much more efficient way to, to get to the right answer. So that is the ideal situation, right? Yes, I think economists wouldn't say it's more efficient because efficiency is the task. Sure, yeah, efficiency but, is, a, is another thing. <laughs> but it's more effective and more reliable. Yeah. Um, well, and maybe we, we waste fewer resources along the way to get there. But also there's tons of different avenues we can explore, right, to build the right technologies to get to that place. So we can work in parallel. Yeah, uh, let the market make the mistakes. The policy won't technically subsidise, so it's still the private sector has to develop the tech, implement it, take the risks, and if they're successful, they get rewarded. So I think that's a healthy way. It's, it's kind of aligned with capitalism, but it, then again, it's not really capitalism in the conventional sense because it's underwritten by uh, this public policy. And I want to say again, if you are thinking about the, the sort of game theoretics of incentive design in order to drive the change we want to see in the world, uh, you are in the right place again. Thanks. Um, um, so, you know, I think, I think one element to this that is on everyone's minds is that this is extremely ambitious. Um, what gives you the idea that this is possible? Very good question. Um, well, there are a few reasons. Um, survival instinct. That's a, that's a good one, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, f from the perspective of grassroots movements in society, I think if enough f philosophers and economists and scientists and engineers look at this, and if they they are convinced, they don't have to believe me or what I say. But if they, for themselves, make up their own mind and they they think, yeah, actually this makes sense, I think thought leaders will influence society and then will find support. On the other hand, uh, with the central bankers and the governments, particularly central banks, currently they um, have announced through the Network for Greening the Financial System and other statements that they really want to help on climate change, but they want to stay market neutral and they really want the government to take care of the problem because they don't want to be loaded with all this responsibility. They feel the governments aren't doing enough. Now, uh, what this theory says is that that's not the right approach. We actually need the central banks to take on the responsibility to underwrite the currency so we can price the risk. And it's a monetary policy and market policy. We create a parallel economy. And then there is the realization that fiat money isn't safe. It's, um, it's good for certain things like producing goods and services, 
but it's not safe when it comes to carbon and energy because um, the growth economy is not allowing us to realize the pathway to one and a half to two degrees. Maybe two we could squeeze in with some luck without this policy, but one and a half, I honestly couldn't see it happening. Right, and, and I think um, the quote that comes to mind, which I am sure this is attributable to a specific person, and I, I do not know who that person is, but there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Um, that, you know, as you said, you, you don't have to, they don't have to trust you if you can kind of lay out the details and, and make it really clear that this is something that central banks should see as within their remit, and this is something that we, we should do collectively, and especially if, if we all can build the tech to make it really uh, very clearly realizable, right, that they can, they can just uh, take this thing and drop it into a financial system um, and decarbonize the world. That's a, that's a pretty strong starting set of arguments. Exactly, and if any central bankers are watching, I would simply say, look, the global carbon reward, it doesn't really re require to do much work. All you've got to do is trade the currency on a computer. It's people like you and everyone here is going to do all the work through uh, the, re the assessments, the MRV, the work on the ground, the financial planning, uh, and everything else. That's where the real work is, and, and the Ministry for the Future, which is the Carbon Exchange Authority, they're going to do the work. Central banks, they get an easy ride. So, so we, have to, we have to do the work to back up your appeal to laziness when you, when you approach the people who are going to back up the currency. <laughs> uh, yeah, but we love the work, don't we? That's good. Let's yeah. do it. Awesome. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that deal. Um, uh, so um, have you, just to, to close, um, have you heard anything today at the Sustainable Blockchain Summit that's um, changed your perspective or made you hopeful? Uh, it's this, just being here has made me m more hopeful because this is the first blockchain anything I've been involved in. And uh, I, I honestly didn't have an opinion or a perspective on how much um, sustainability work was being done in the blockchain space. I thought it was really quite fringe, but um, I guess I, I'm fringe anyway, so I'm at home. <laughs> no, totally. Yeah. Um, maybe we are the fringe now, but we might be the mainstream in another 10 years. That's, that's what yeah. we're about, absolutely. Yeah. Driven by survival instinct and appeal to laziness, right? That's, that's what's gonna, this is gonna get us there. Awesome. And I think, you know, one of the things that, that really makes me hopeful about sort of every time um, we, we are able to, to gather together, right, is how we really do keep that perspective, right, is that I think people in this space really see extractive industries and climate change as our competitors, and we're sort of working in the same industry, but we don't, we're not competing with each other, we're competing with the facts on the ground, which are that climate change is coming, we're not solving it fast enough, and we need to realign the global economy um, with the natural world uh, so that we can all have a, a better, more sustainable future. Hear, hear. <laughs>So I think we have a couple more minutes. Um, can we take one or two, maybe three questions from the audience uh, for Delton? Hi, thank you. Um, earlier you talked about the transition from the current economy to the parallel economy rather than the degrowth. Can you just give an example of what's the incentive for that or how it actually, how it happens? How, do, how and why do people move from the current economy into the parallel one? Um, technically, people won't move into the parallel economy. Um, what's happening is we're creating a new value context with the new currency, and that uh, by having a parallel economy, we want it to be very specialised. So it's only going to be undertaking carbon removal and mitigation, conventional mitigation. So it's very specialised. Then we, uh, if we need more mitigation, we increase the exchange rate, which is the price signal. Technically speaking, the carbon reward is the exchange rate. So that's calibrated to the amount of carbon remover we'll, we will need. That's an optimistic minimal amount. And then we use the other rules for uh, conventional mitigation 
to help move that along as well. So we, with the policy, we can cover the carbon removal, which is necessary, and then that's rule three, rules one and two for conventional mitigation, that's to help to overcome the bottlenecks. So the, the, the hard to abate sectors and the problem of too much extraction of fossil fuels around the world, somehow pay them to stop and build renewable energy infrastructure. So um, to go into it, uh, we really need, unfortunately, whether you like it or hate it, I don't know, but we need the top-down agreement internationally for central banks or similar institutions to back that currency exchange rate. Then what happens, in my opinion, is that I, I have this theory about society and people. We, when our moral compass is aligned to profit, we get really excited about things and we uh, love green projects because we can be moral and m you know what I mean, you're popular at parties and stuff like that. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so there's a strong synergy there and so society, once they learn about the reward and learn about mitigation by investing in it, because everyone will begin to invest as well, that's the key thing, stock market. Uh, equity funds, pension funds will begin investing both the currency and green projects because they're bankable and profitable. Uh, this will change the moral compass and the political landscape. The, the, this, the theory of change is that as this is happening, politics will adapt because pol politicians will realise that people now agree with the mitigation economy. They agree with strong mitigation because why? There's a profit opportunity or a better one. And thus, over time, uh, people will then will say, well, hey, we've got those rewards, but why aren't we taxing these dirty industries more? Because we're offering rewards, it means that taxes can then rise in sympathy. So we get carrots and sticks over time, whereas uh, I think in the past 10 or 20 years, we're trying with the taxes, but uh, they, they do reach a lot of political resistance because they're so easily undermined with political rhetoric and fear. Um, People would rather be rewarded than taxed, perhaps? I, I think yeah. so. I, I think that makes sense, yeah. I yeah. think that tracks. Um, I also love how um, you implied before that we're building the fringe economy, and once that scales, it's going to be the much more respectable parallel economy. So, you know, we can, yeah. we can go there, yeah. Well, sorry, just one more comment, if I may. Uh, the degrowth economy, or concept, um, where I find that difficult to uh, visualise is in central banking and monetary policy because if we don't have growth, the central banks will have a freak out because they know they need growth for financial stability uh, and they actually target growth. They might not say that publicly, but they target a certain amount of inflation, a certain amount of growth because it stabilises the financial system. So you're kind of stuck there if you, if you don't have a monetary approach, if, if that makes sense. Another question here. You talked earlier about uh, establishing a price floor for these uh, uh, new tokens and that being part of the exchange rate and that being supported by the governments. Wouldn't that be really expensive uh, potentially? And how do you see the feasibility of getting governments to commit that amount of money or financial resource to help support the price floor and the desired exchange rate that we would actually need to get the mitigation we really need to stay within planetary boundaries? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, in, in the presentation I gave, there was one diagram, a chart of the price over 100 years, and the price is calibrated to rise over 30, 40 years, peak and then gradually fall or plateau. That's calibrated to the carbon removal we need. Now, uh, because it's rising for a period of time, it's actually an asset. So what the, the central banks are doing with the guarantee, they're creating a bull market in the currency. So the governments won't have to pay for it because the private sector will buy it as an investment for that period. It's only later that they have to expand the money supply. But because it's the central banks expanding the money supply, uh, there is no direct cost to governments. There is no direct cost to business or individuals. There's no tax, there's no fee. We, we, we're channeling the cost into the currency markets. Because it's using monetary policy to, to redirect capital flows. Yes. So Herman Daly uh, has advice for how to get out of a recession. So his advice is like you, you, tax, you uh, tax more for the wealthy, you spend, and you increase the money supply. So that's a combination of inflationary and deflationary policies 
mixed together in the right ways softens the blow of a recession and gets the economy going again. Right. So this is a kind of a deleveraging of the carbon debt bubble through a similar approach with inflationary and deflationary policies. And, and I think regardless, it is, um, you know, as, as you're pointing out, it is a huge lift, right? And I think what really draws me to the GCR is that it is one of very few, few projects tackling the climate crisis at the scale of the climate crisis, right? So it's, it's like the amount of money and the amount of resources that would need to be mobilized by the GCR are the amount of money and resources that would need to be mobilized in order to stop climate change. So yeah, it's a lot, but it's a big problem. I think we have time for one more question. Hey, yeah. Yeah, um, so thanks for the talk earlier and also this. Um, I have to say that I'm, I'm really fascinated by the fact that you're using what I recognize as being some traditional economic, uh, fiscal and monetary policies to kind of solve this problem using the tools that some would say have created the problem. So my question to you is what is the biggest counter argument or challenge that you have encountered as you've been presenting this set of interventions, um, be it from folks that are saying that consumerism and neoliberalism are all kind of the same versions of the, the, the same capitalistic, nihilistic <laughs> tendency. So what is the main challenge that, let's say, you've heard to the concepts that you're presenting here, which to me seem sound, they feel sound, but I could imagine that there are challenges. And what is the major one that, that kind of has been targeted at you or your, your thoughts and how have you responded to that? I, I would say the biggest challenge intellectually is when uh, economists uh, immediately use the word inflation. So if we're going to expand the money supply, uh, it's a kind of a knee-jerk reaction. Oh, we're going to create inflation, and then everyone's worried about inflation. So um, to respond to that uh, fear or that question, uh, we, we need to take a long-term view. We need to explain what I described a moment ago, that we create an asset that uh, creates a bull market in the currency with the private, public finance guarantee. So we're actually divesting the cost into the private sector. So we overcome this inflationary problem for a period of time. It's later in the century where the central banks will be doing more money printing. And this is where the challenge is. And the response I have is probably we need to do macroeconomic modeling uh, to, to do the number crunching and see what it looks like and um, show that to the economists and let's see, let's discuss you know, uh, without that hard data, you can't really have an argument because it, it, I, I've, what I see of economists, they love to talk about things qualitatively, but you've got to nail them with some numbers and then, then have a proper discussion. Amazing. Well, I think that wraps up our fireside chat. Um, thank you all so much for coming to the third SBS. <laughs> Thank you to Delton Chen uh, for being here.